Well, that was interesting. We're live streaming on YouTube. And of course, I was hearing it both uh, uh, going and coming. Uh, nonetheless, it's terrific to uh, see everyone today uh, as we look at the diaspora of uh, the Compact's uh, Free Association citizens, citizens from Palau, the Republic of the Marshall Islands, and the Federated States of Micronesia. Uh, we're very uh, uh, happy to be joined today by my colleagues from the Government Accountability Office. We are joined by panelists, uh, David Gutnick, Emil Freiberg, and Caitlin Mitchell, and I'll just introduce them in a second. And I, I just wanna say uh, how thrilled I am to be joined uh, by my colleagues from the GAO. You know, on Sunday, I was just looking at the, the paper and there was a story about Marshallese in Spokane County in Washington state. And it was a really striking story and it was a very tragic story too. You know, it was mentioning that, um, it was mentioning that uh, of the COVID-19 uh, cases in Spokane County, uh, that 25% of them were represented by Marshallese uh, migrants. But the Marshallese migrants are a tiny portion of Spokane County's population, less than 1%. And I thought, my goodness, there's an important and vital story to tell about the diaspora population. And so GAO is helping tell that story. They've done deep consultation with communities uh, in, on, in, in the continental United States in Hawaii, in uh, Guam, in CNMI. Uh, they've traveled to the Pacific and met with people and they have a story to tell. And telling that story will be, the, will be David Gutnick, who served as the director of the International Affairs and Trade Division of the US Government Accountability Office since September, 2001. His portfolio includes issues affecting the Commonwealth of the Northern Marianas Islands, American Samoa, and the Freely Associated States. Uh, from 1994 to 2001, he served as the Director of the Office for Medical Services of the Peace Corps and as Director of the University Health Service at New York University from 1991 to 1994. Dr. Gutnick holds an MD from the University of Rochester and a bachelor's degree from Harvard. Joining uh, David will be Emil Freiberg. Emil is the assistant director and senior economist of the international affairs and trade team at the US Government Accountability Office. His responsibilities include reviews of the implementation of the Compacts of Free Association and the Federated with the Federated States of Micronesia, uh, the Republic of the Marshall Islands and Palau which also includes the role of economic assistance and the viability of trust funds to support the FAS government operation and the com and compact migration. Dr. Freiberg holds a PhD from the University of North Carolina and a bachelor's degree from the University of Texas. And I'm happy to say he's also an adjunct professor at my center at Georgetown University. And finally, we're joined by uh, Caitlin Mitchell, who's a senior analyst in the international affairs and trade team at the US GAO. And she leads performance audits of uh, federal programs in the areas of uh, national security and foreign policy. Her work focuses on the intersection of international affairs and domestic policy on topics such as compact migration, Confucius Institutes on US campuses, financial contributions to UN peacekeeping operations, and US efforts to counter ISIS messaging. Prior to uh, serving at GAO, she worked at the Department of Defense and studied at the University of Pittsburgh, where I used to teach. Uh, and she holds a, 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 a master's from Pitt and a BA in Russian from Dickinson College. Um, we're going to uh, turn to David Gutnick in just a moment and our three speakers will, uh, will address us. And I just wanna say that the way we're going to handle this because of the number of participants we have is that I'll ask all uh, participants when it comes to Q&A to please lodge your questions through the chat function in the Zoom window. Uh, that's, uh, I, I, it may not be quite as fun as, as speaking your question, but it will be easier, I think, to handle if we do it that way, uh, particularly with bandwidth issues and so on. So uh, the other thing I might ask you to do, if you're able to, to uh, mute your video uh, image as well, that ha helps handle bandwidth for those who are uh, trying to uh, uh, work their way through narrow bandwidth. So let me turn, David, to you and ask you to make some comments and I'll let you uh, 
uh, hand off uh, when you're done to the following speaker. Uh, David, Caitlin, and Emil, you're able to unmute yourselves as uh, you have that capability. So David, over to you. Great, thank you. Uh, Caitlin, we're gonna put up some a slide right away. Yeah, great. Um, uh, give me one second. Well, oh, I've managed to, I'm so sorry, one second. I'm so sorry, I've, well, um, okay, there we go. My apologies, folks. I'm a little minor technical difficulties from my end. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. Um, listen, um, uh, Alan, thanks for inviting us uh, to present at this webinar. Um, uh, and thank you all for coming to this event. And Alan, I appreciate your statement a moment ago about uh, uh, Spokane. Um, we've all been reading about this, uh, Springdale, Spokane, elsewhere. and for, Caitlin Amel and I have been looking at this issue for a year and it certainly puts a human face on it uh, as we go forward uh, studying and uh, uh, looking at this. Um, yesterday, Caitlin and Amel and I uh, had a chance to look at the attendees for this hour. And um, I must say, we certainly recognize that there's a tremendous wealth of, of knowledge and of lived experience uh, on this topic amongst all you here this afternoon. So um, we'll try to live up to that uh, in this presentation. Uh, I think we have some good information to present. We're shooting for about 30 minutes and then we look forward to a good uh, Q&A. Let me take just one quick second to uh, speak about GAO. So we're an arm of Congress. Uh, we're established in 1921 through the Budget and Accounting Act. It's the same legislation that established OMB and, and actually the modern uh, executive branch budgeting process. Uh, we were established in large measure to enhance uh, oversight, Congress's oversight of the executive branch. And so we evaluate executive branch programs, operations. We generally have access to US government records and US government officials. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's not. That's, that's how we do our work. Um, our work is often directed in legislation and actually the amended compact directed us to do work in sort of the first uh, what, 10 years of the, of the amended compact period. Uh, but most of our work is done uh, pursuant to requests by chairs and ranking members uh, of committees of jurisdiction uh, uh, in Congress. Uh, and this the report on which this presentation is based originated from requests from Chairman Chair Murkowski of Senate Energy. As I think people know, Senate Energy and House Natural Resources have a deep and abiding interest in uh, in in uh, the freely associated states, going all the way back to the trust territory days. Um, so let me say a few things of just introducing co compact migration with apologies uh, to those of you who are uh, very familiar with this topic. Uh, let me just say that, you know, a couple of key, uh, a couple of key things. Of course, the, the key objectives of the compacts were um, first, establish self-governance, second, provide for defense and security interests, and finally, to a provision of U.S. economic assistance. Uh, a key provision in the first title in the self-governance was the migration rights. Um, and specifically with few exceptions, uh, uh, citizens of the freely associated states may enter the US visa free and may lawfully reside and work indefinitely in the US and its territories. So that's the language. A couple of things worthy of mention on this topic. First, um, the migration rights do not end in 20, 2023 or 24 in the case of Palau. They remain intact as long as the compacts are in effect. You know, some provisions in the compact are time bound, the, the economic assistance in particular, but not this provision. And as I think folks know, the compacts exist in perpetuity unless ended by mutual agreement of the US and the compact nation. And in some places we've done our work, this has been a source of misunderstanding. Folks are um, uh, of the impression or of the understanding that the migration provisions end. Uh, and as I'm sure most of you know, they do not. Um, uh, the, US the US implementing legislation for the compacts, those with Micronesia and the Marshall Islands at any rate stated that with respect to these migration provisions, it was not the intent, it was not Congress's intent 
to cause any adverse consequences in the U.S. and its territories. Um, and at that time, you know, this is in 1986, the legislation identified Hawaii, Guam, and the Mariana Islands and American Samoa as affected jurisdictions and authorized but did not appropriate funds uh, to these U.S. areas uh, uh, by virtue of the fact that they might see increased demand for public services. Um, uh, education uh, and public public services were mentioned at the time, not health, interestingly, but uh, of course that's emerged as an important uh, issue uh, in compact migration. Uh, the amended compacts both authorized and appropriated funds for compact impact, $30 million annually. Uh, in the first compact period, although not uh, not appropriated, there were a, uh, a couple of years, I believe, where, where uh, money was appropriated to the affected jurisdictions, but since 2003, it's been annual. And the amended compacts also require these enumerations every five years, enumerations of compact migrants in the affected jurisdictions uh, done in, 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 uh, in order to apportion out the $30 million in proportion to the, uh, uh, in proportion to the populations in, the, in, the, in, the, in Guam, Hawaii, CNMI and to a much lesser extent American Samoa. The last enumeration was in 2018, and that's the that's the last enumeration in the amended compact period. And we'll have more to say about that shortly. And then finally, the the implementing legislation established a very specific definition for a compact migrant for the purposes of enumeration, um, and that definition is citizens of the freely associated states who entered the United States after 1986 for Micronesian Marshall Islands after 94 in uh, Palau and their US born, citizen, uh, US born children. So US born children are of course US citizens, but they're also compact migrants under the implementing legislation. And so I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues uh, in a second. Let me just mention, uh, I think we're gonna go to the next slide, um, Caitlin. Yeah, so we, we GFO have, re have reported on um, uh, compact migration on three occasions. Uh, I was not around for the first one, uh, Emil was, so you can ask him detailed uh, 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 questions on that, on that 2001 report. Um, but in 2011, uh, and that was in sort of the run up to the amended compact period when this was uh, uh, a, a, you know important issue in the, in the renegotiations. Um, uh, in 2011, we examined census and the enumeration data, and we also examined uh, the financial impacts, the reported financial impacts uh, in Guam, Hawaii, and Northern Mariana Islands. At that time, we observed weaknesses in the compact impact reporting methodologies. So, from, for example, amongst other things, they didn't capture benefits uh, of, of the benefits that the compact migrants provide uh, in the locations where they migrate, as well as costs. There were a few other methodological weaknesses. And at that time, we recommended that Interior take steps to improve compact reporting. Um, unfortunately, Interior has not taken that steps. There really were, as I understand it, some draft uh, guidance to the, free, to the affected jurisdictions, but it was never implemented. Um, and in this most recent work, the, the report we're gonna talk about today, we again mined this, the census data, the American Community Survey and the required enumerations to speak to what's known about the number, the demographics, the location of compact migrants, and in particular in trends in compact migration uh, since our last report. Uh, we also report on the costs uh, as reported by the effective jurisdictions. And this time we provide a fair bit of information on the effects of compact migration on various public and private sector actors in the US and then in the territories. A lot of that is based on uh, some really detailed uh, interviews that we've done, um, Caitlin and Emil, uh, amongst others, interviewed 500 people for this report. Uh, and uh, that is reflected in the, the way in which we speak to the, the report reported effect of compact migration on a whole variety of actors. Uh, the last thing I want to say before turning it over to Caitlin is that uh, because this reporting on uh, the demographics, the number of migrants and the demographic features relies on the American Community Survey and on the enumerations, um, uh, what mirrors that information. And what you'll see, and I think many have realized, is that these numbers are lower than some other estimates 
that have been made about the numbers of compact migrants. Uh, it's a, uh, and we, we've got feedback on that in 2011 and we got feedback again on it uh, uh, in this report. It's a really good topic. Uh, we're gonna speak to it to, to some extent, but it's also a really good topic for the q and I think. Um, what I can say is we put census through their paces to, uh, they were great colleagues, but we put them through their paces to provide us the data. And um, we identified a number of interesting wrinkles along the way, which we'll discuss. Um, so with that, I'm pleased to turn it over to uh, Caitlin. Thank you, David. So the first section of our report focused on compact migrant populations in US areas. Um, as David described, the enumerations provide data on compact migrants in selected areas, particularly Hawaii, Guam, and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands or the CNMI. Um, however, GAO has also reported on compact migrant populations uh, more broadly in the 50 states, DC and Puerto Rico, using five-year data from the Census Bureau's American Community Survey. Um, so GAO last reported on compact migration in 2011 when there were an estimated 56,000 compact migrants in US areas. Uh, in our new report, as you can see in this map, um, we found the population of compact migrants actually rose an estimated 68% in the interim to about 94,000 individuals. Historically, most of the compact migrant population has lived in the affected jurisdictions of Hawaii, Guam, and the CNMI. However, we found in the data for this report that there's actually been a shift with about half of compact migrants now living on the US mainland. Um, this bar chart here shows you the US areas with an estimated 1,000 or more compact migrants. As part of our review, um, as David noted, we traveled to uh, the six areas that have the largest per capita share of compact migrants relative to their overall population. So that's the first five bars on the left, plus the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. For the first time, we were also able to use American sur community survey data to tabulate demographic information for this population, such as how many compact migrants were born in each of the freely associated states, um, as well as an estimate of those serving in the US military. Uh, you can find that demographic information in the body of our report, as well as in Appendix 2 and Appendix 4. Um, as David mentioned, some stakeholders we interviewed expressed concerns that the number of compact migrants we found um, through census data is an undercount. Uh, of course, the American Community Survey is a survey, uh, so these are estimates, and we're aware of um, concerns about things like non-response rates to that survey, um, language barriers, and other challenges that the American Community Survey and the decennial, um, decennial census data collection experience with other populations in addition to this population. Finally, uh, through interviews with compact migrant populations in the areas we visited, we learned that common reasons for migrations from the freely associated states to US areas include both economic and educational opportunities, as well as greater access to healthcare. Um, some people also describe moving to join family members already living here uh, or for greater personal freedom. So next up, AMO will discuss uh, this population and compact impact specifically in the affected Pacific jurisdictions. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, as David noted in his introduction, Congress had identified affected jurisdictions in the Pacific because it was particularly interested in the impact of migration there. I'm going to discuss uh, Guam, Hawaii, and the Northern Mariana Islands in three ways. Uh, first, we're going to talk about some compact migrant trends on five-year intervals, um, then talk about some reported compact cost data, and then also what federal funds have gone to these jurisdictions to offset some of this impact. So uh, this is a graphic reproduced from our report. And uh, just, just note, uh, since this has been collecting data on compact migration uh, since the early 90s on behalf of the census, uh, on behalf of Interior, and uh, these are sort of five-year interval reporting. The last enumeration is 2018. Um, one comment about the definition of compact migrant uh, illustrated in our data is that it represents people that have migrated from the freely associated states during the compact interval and their U.S. born children up to age 18. So once someone passes their 18th birthday, they drop out of this sort of definition. And this was written into the statute that Congress passed in 2003. Um, from this graphic, you can see that the uh, Hawaii has experienced pretty uh, steady growth. It surpassed uh, Guam as the largest destination in the Pacific sometime between 2008 and 2013. Um, there's at this point about uh, 24,000 compact migrants in Hawaii. 
Uh, Guam actually shows some stability, I think, over the last 15 year interval of, of enumerations. There's about 19,000 people enumerated. Uh, the Mariana Islands has actually uh, uh, shown a decline from the 2003 data, and uh, today has about 2,500 people. This decline really sort of uh, tracks the uh, decline in the CNMI uh, garment industry, where a lot of these people work. Uh, David said we found some wrinkles in the data, so let me start there. So um, this data that we're illustrating for 2013 and 2018 actually differs from data that's uh, been in the public domain and is currently posted on the Department of Interior's website. Uh, during the course of our job, we asked uh, Census to do a number of extracts for us of, of new data. In the course of doing that, they discovered a programming error in their uh, prior uh, extracts they had done for Interior. So specifically in 2013, Census had undercounted Hawaii compact migrants by 6,000, and for 2018 had undercounted those migrants by 7,000. And so the data we're reporting today is, is different than what people may have seen in the public domain. Uh, turning now to some of the tabulated migrant impact costs, this again is, is reporting by the three Pacific jurisdictions. Um, you know, one, one sort of bottom line is that Hawaii and Guam are both showing basically an upward trend over time for reported compact costs. Uh, CNMI actually has sort of had variable costs. Um, if you take all three of these jurisdictions together um, and look at this period of the, of the amended compact period, so 2004 through 2018, uh, the joint reporting is for basically 3.2 billion in cost. Uh, of that, Hawaii is 1.8 billion. There are about 200 million in the last year on this graphic. Uh, Guam has reported 1.2 billion. That's about 150 uh, million in 2017. Just, just to note, Guam did not uh, prepare a 2018 estimate. And the CNMI in total has reported about 116 million compact impact costs. It's about 10 million in the last year on this graphic 2018. Uh, for Guam and Hawaii, the, the, the large sort of driver of this cost of reported cost is in education. Uh, this easily reflects the number of school children, compact migrant uh, migrants that are school children, but also the US born school children of compact migrants that attend schools. In CNMI, the largest category uh, identified by the government is public safety. If I can just turn for a second, not, not with a slide at this point, but um, just to note that the federal government since 2004 has provided funds to these jurisdictions uh, in total of 509 million. Uh, most of this has been provided uh, through the $30 million annual uh, appropriation that Congress authorized and appropriated in 2003. These funds will end in 2023. So it's a 20 year tranche of funding. There has been a few other additional uh, funds provided during this period. Um, now thinking about the funding, uh, it's been distributed based on these population estimates. Uh, note, noting that uh, census has now revised its estimates for Hawaii in 2013 and 2018. The implication of that is that the funds that have already been provided to uh, Guam, CNMI and Hawaii were basically misallocated with the wrong population data. Um, and so right now Interior has proposed to look at the future funding for, 20, for 2021 through 2023 and adjust the grants to offset this, um, this misallocation from the past. So that's kind of the status of, of some of these uh, funds that have been provided by the uh, Department of the Interior. I want to turn it over now to Caitlin, who's going to talk a little about some of the things we heard about the effects on governments, uh, workforce, and um, societies. Thanks, Emil. Um, so in addition, as Emil described, in addition to examining compact impact in the affected jurisdictions, we looked more broadly at the effects on governments, workforces, and societies. Uh, government officials in all of the areas we visited described engaging with this population, particularly in the areas of public education and healthcare. Uh, so as part of this review, we worked with multiple federal agencies to determine compact migrant eligibility for a select number of federal programs you can see listed here. Uh, there's a full version of this, including very detailed notes on the programs on uh, page 12 of our published report. 
governments in the areas we visited often raised concerns um, at the federal level regarding compact migrants, general lack of access to Medicaid in particular. Um, as noted in the table, although compact migrants are eligible to purchase health insurance through the Affordable Care Act exchanges or through their employers, some compact migrants indicated that these plans were just financially out of reach for them or their families. So this combined with the lack of access to Medicaid often means that this particular population goes uninsured. Three of the states that we visited, uh, Hawaii, Oregon, and Washington, have found a way to cover compact migrants by fully paying their health insurance premiums using federal and state funds. In these states programs, compact migrants enroll in an eligible plan through the exchanges. Then the federal government pays for part of the plan through advanced premium tax credits, which are paid directly to the insurer. Um, the state government then covers the remaining balance of the premium. So since 2015 in Hawaii, the healthcare premium assistance program has covered premiums for uh, Hawaii residents who are under the federal poverty level, but who do not qualify for Medicaid. Um, the majority of its enrollees though are compact migrants, about 3,223 as of 2017. Um, Oregon and Washington have similar programs to Hawaii's, though their programs are actually specific to compact migrants. Oregon's COFA Premium Assistance Program was launched in 2017 and leverages $9 of federal funds through the Advanced Premium Tax Credit for every $1 of Oregon state funds allocated. Um, enrollees in Oregon's program also can apply for reimbursement of their um, out-of-pocket medical costs. As of October of last year, there were almost 800 compact migrants enrolled in that program. Uh, Washington's COFA Islander Healthcare Program, which you see uh, an advertisement for here, uh, just started last year and uh, covers out-of-pocket costs by providing a pre-loaded pre uh, payment card to its enrollees that they can use for co-pays and other expenses. Um, Washington's program will also uniquely cover dental insurance for compact migrants starting in 2021. Uh, there were about 1,100 compact migrants enrolled last year. Um, other than healthcare, though, we studied other effects, including the contributions that compact migrants make to the workforces in these U.S. areas. Um, we note in our report that compact migrants have long worked in Arkansas's poultry processing facilities, as well as their roles in tourism and service industries in the Pacific areas, um, also as business owners, teachers, government employees, um, and particularly their work in caregiving industries, including senior care homes. Um, we heard from compact migrants about workforce, um, sorry, workplace challenges that they encounter, including documentation issues with both the Form I-94 and with getting real ID compliant driver's licenses, in addition to labor abuse and um, some other workplace discrimination that's been well documented in the press. Finally, we reported on societal effects of compact migration, including public health issues like tuberculosis and Hansen's in some communities, uh, public order and law enforcement issues, as well as community and volunteer work. Um, for example, in Hawaii, we learned about freely associated state communities participating in environmental cleanup work or leveraging their agricultural expertise to help Hawaii farmers grow a more resilient version of taro. Um, many FAS community members also serve as translators and navigators within their own communities, particularly to newcomers from their areas or in their areas. And with that, I'll turn it back to you, Emil. Okay, I'm going to... Uh drop the slides and uh, maybe I'll go back to speaker uh, version. So I, I just want to close by um, by talking a little bit about some of the other material in our report, just so you sort of know, recognize that it's there. Um, we actually have 20 appendices in this report, and I just want to point out that some of our best material may be there. So uh, if you look at the report, uh, don't stop after you see the signature that David had. So. Um, one thing that GAO does is it, do, it completes its work. So we do meet very diligently with federal agencies, and in this case, state, territorial, and FAS governments. Uh, we interact with them throughout the review, and we give them opportunities to um, you know, pr provide inputs and corrections to our report as we go along. At the end of the project, we actually provide our report to the people we've met with in that capacity for official agency comments. And in this case, we received uh, nine comments. They, they are reproduced in our report as appendices. So three are from freely associated states, from the ambassadors at the embassies, uh, the, the Pacific territories of Guam and the CNMI, and the four US states, Arkansas, Hawaii, Oregon, and Washington, all wrote letters. They're, they're, very quite, in, they're quite interesting in and of themselves, and they raise different issues from different uh, state perspectives. 
Um, if I could just mention a few of the comments they had, and I know that some of the, even some of the authors of the letters, I think are on the, are on the call today. So we may want to uh, hear from them in a few minutes, but the, the ambassadors, particularly from the FAS had a, had a few points I just highlight. One is that migration rights provided uh, through the compact are really a fundamental and essential part of the agreement and the relationship with the United States. There were also comments that, that restoring uh, Medicaid eligibility for citizens living and working in the US would be a great benefit, both to the, to the citizens of the FAS in the US, but also to the uh, areas that have received them to reduce impact costs, for example. Um, and lastly, it's, it's as David sort of uh, noted earlier, there's, there's the concern that, that rather than just focus on compact costs, there's also the consideration of what are the benefits of compact migration. Uh, these include um, uh, working in jobs, job creation, taxes paid, and also con contributions to um, the community broadly. In looking at the, the uh, US states and territories, they also had a few uh, key comments I would just highlight. Again, uh, restoring compact migration eligibility for Medicaid would improve health and reduce local impact. And, and just by way of comment, this was actually a, a statutory change that took place in 1996. So this was during the, the initial uh, compact period where uh, there was a revision uh, to the Welfare Reform Act that removed the eligibility for uh, this population for Medicaid. Another area commented on by the US uh, states and territories, and well, actually this is some of the US states, is that there are areas now that are outside of the affected jurisdiction definition, which have significant populations and are not receiving uh, any federal impact compensation, if you will. Uh, two, of the two, two of the states, uh, Washington and Oregon, uh, noted the legacy of nuclear testing in the marshals as an important issue that should be highlighted in discussions of compact migration. And as David alluded to earlier, uh, we did have one concern particularly raised about the census population estimates being too low. In this case, it was from the state of Arkansas, which had also commented on this in 2011. So those were some of the agency, we call them agency comments, but here they're all institutional comments. Uh, I just wanna highlight a few of the appendices so that you, you know what some of the good stuff that's, that's in the back. Uh, Caitlin mentioned that we have more population data and just to, to sort of, again, point that out, we were able to get census to do some special runs for us in the American Community Survey. So we have data on sort of age distribution, educational attainment, uh, employment status, military service, health insurance coverage, use of public assistance and social security, and personal income earnings levels of compact migrants across the 50 states and uh, uh, Puerto Rico and DC, I guess. Uh, the American Community Survey does not cover Guam and the CNMI, so the, uh, the other US territories are excluded. So that's sort of the restriction on that. But this is, I think, the first time this data has been made publicly available. Uh, we also do have an, append uh, an appendix that uh, uh, captures what I would call sort of stakeholder suggestions to address compact migration challenges. And as David alluded to, we you know, if you, if you sum up the, the number of people that were in different interviews we met with, there were about 500. Uh, in the territories and states, we actually had 91 interviews. And we met with a lot of uh, compact migrant community members, particularly in evening meetings uh, in Guam, Hawaii, and the, and the U.S. mainland states. And so um, there were about 200 people in those meetings. So we heard a lot, we heard a lot of information, and a lot of things. And we have tried to capture uh, some of those insights and observations, concerns, basically, in some ways, in those, in those appendices, in this appendix. And so I just want to highlight that. The, uh, the other thing that um, we do have an appendix on, which is we, we do have a presentation on the nonprofit um, and private sector organizations that are um, both being organized by the compact migrant communities, but also are there providing some assistance to those communities. And just to highlight a couple of them, um, Micronesian Resource Center in Guam is a pretty prominent organization today. It does receive some interior department funding. Uh, we are Art Oceana in Hawaii, is a, has similar status, receiving some interior funds. 
There's also Arkansas Coalition of Marshallese. There's several organizations in Arkansas and uh, one of the ones in the Northwest, which we interacted with a, a good bit was the uh, COFA Alliance for Na Alliance National Network. And they have actually, um, you know, groups kind of throughout the country as we understand it. So I think this is one of the things which, which I've worked on all three of these jobs. So just one thing I was really struck by as we con conducted this third review is the, uh, the, the breadth of, of advocacy and organization within the community. And I know as we talk about things like the impact of COVID in the health condition of the community, that there's, there are now a lot, of, a lot of people engaged on it that I don't really think we, we, we saw that engagement in 2011 and, and in our 21 review. So I wanna turn it back to you, Alan, and thank you for letting us make this presentation. And, and thanks for all of you who've joined us today. I know we've met with some of you in the course of this job, and I know we, GAO's met with some of you in previous work. So thank you for joining us. Well, thanks very much. That was uh, an excellent presentation. And um, I, I think that you've uh, uh, highlighted a number of, of different issues. Um, just as a comment, your report, of course, is available online and through the GAO website. And I will uh, put an echo of that uh, link on the, uh, the website at the Center for Australia, New Zealand and Pacific Studies. And so if you haven't had an opportunity to read the report, uh, anyone in the audience, I would strongly encourage that, uh, that you get a hold of it and, and take a look. Um, I'd like to open the floor up uh, for some, some question and comment. And again, I'd ask you to type your uh, question into the, um, the, uh, the uh, message window on Zoom, and then we can take those and uh, give them to, uh, to the audience. Um, I'm curious though, uh, while the audience is thinking a bit about um, what questions they might have, you know, you've gone out and you've talked to 500 people in the community and had an opportunity to hear from them about their concerns and um, their issues. And I'm just curious, did you hear anything amongst those uh, issues that surprised you? Uh, either, or, or perhaps did you not hear something that you were expecting to hear and were surprised by its absence? I'd be curious to get your response. Um, I would maybe just add one thing and then let, let Caitlin maybe comment a little bit about some of the key things we heard. But uh, one, one, of the, one of the things that has, has become much, much more of a, of a concern and an interaction issue is really, I'll call it Department of Homeland Security paperwork. Um, and so part of this is the, um, the rollout of the secure ID driver's license, uh, the way it's being used by employers and, and sort of what the requirements have been to, um, to be able to, 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 uh, to maintain and receive updated and, and, mod and uh, um, you know, sufficient paperwork. And so that, that, was not, that was simply not something that was a real issue in the previous two GAO reports. Um, People talk extensively about access to healthcare. And so I would echo that this is still a um, primary concern for the, among the community is the sort of their ability to, to find healthcare and get access to healthcare. But Caitlin, do you have any um, things you would like to add to that? Sure. Um, I, I would echo what, what Emil said um, in particular about a lot of the documentation challenges. Um, I was surprised by um, the extent, um, the extent of them, and the extent to which a lot of the communities were well versed in those challenges. Um, I was also personally surprised by just again the, the misconception about the end date that the, the end, misconception of there being an end date for the migration provisions, and just um, populations uncertain about what would happen in 2023 or 2024. Um, additionally, um, less on the the compact migrant side, and more on maybe the the state official side. Um, I was surprised the extent to which the states had developed these um, programs leveraging the federal advanced premium tax credit to offer, in the cases of Oregon and Washington, um, particularly targeted access for health care. So. Thank you. So it looks like we've got a question that's come in. And uh, the question is from Brittany Wheeler. And uh, Brittany um, is wondering if there has been any increased attention amongst any of stakeholders working with you or in your office about the relationship between climate change and migration, 
or climate change uh, in the RMI uh, more broadly. And, and I'm curious, I'd, I'd, I'd maybe like to, to, to drill down a little bit on the climate, qu climate change question. Um, is that something that anyone mentioned? Is that an issue? Um, I'll, I'll jump in and then I'm going to actually ask David to say a couple of words about GAO's recent work and report on climate change that mentions the Marshall Islands. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I would say that climate change is, is discussed some. So people do discuss it. They do raise the issue as you, as you, you would imagine. Mm -hmm. but, I, but I think when, when uh, migrants really speak of what brings them to uh, to have moved uh, to either the mainland states or the, the Guam, Sinai, and Hawaii, it's it's often education. It's often following family members, uh, and then some people are are moving for access to healthcare. Uh, and so that's you know th those are I think usually the things people are raising, and 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 climate may be helping be a push factor with respect to what's available for economic development in the Marshall Islands, particularly, or other atoll nations. But that's, that's just kind of my observation from listening to people discuss it in these meetings. Uh, David? Yeah, thanks. Um, a, a little bit off topic, but uh, we have, uh, separately, I have a team, I and a team have been doing work uh, based on requests from uh, five senators, uh, Warren, Markey, Merkley, Feinberg and White House uh, on what state and AID have been doing, uh, basically in terms of um, primarily AID in terms of, of the their contracting and grant making activities to support adaptation and resilience. Um, the the key thing that we found, frankly, is uh, or that we documented and I think uh, uh, reported on in a thorough manner is the the uh, three executive orders and a presidential directive that were established in the prior administration, three of four of which, and frankly, the three most potent ones have been revoked in this administration. And we kind of detailed exactly what it was that, and this is really just executive orders and PDDs with respect to state and AIDs activities, uh, uh, and, and basically show the changing priorities in this administration. Uh, we did use uh, Marshall Islands as a, a case study. It's an enclosure in the back of the report that uh, uh, is a, a walkthrough of the issues there with um, uh, a rising sea level primarily. Um, and I think that's familiar to a lot of folks. But, you know, um, we documented the change in priorities of this administration from the prior one uh, in international affairs. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, David. Um, <clears throat> we've got another question here um, about um, uh, disaggregated data. Uh, uh, is there a, any recommendations on where to obtain disaggregated data uh, based on each of the three COFA entities? Uh, Caitlin, would you take that with respect to our work? Sure. So, um... So that, that is, of, of course, a challenge. Um, combining all three FAS actually is what allowed us to be able to report some of this demographic information. Um, working with census, we learned that um, just by the nature of the American Community Survey, survey and, and how um, relatively small some of these populations are in some US areas, um, they aren't able to, or they have to suppress some of this data um, when you start to drill down to the individual freely associated state level. Um, one place that our report does provide some information, though, is um, Table 11 in Appendix 2 breaks out the state um, state by state population, um, how many hail from FSM um, versus Marshall Islands versus Palau. Um, but beyond that, I'm, I'm not personally aware of um, additional data sources that would get to that level of granularity by, by each FAS. Great. Thank you very much. Um, uh, a question that I think um, is is um, kind of one I I suppose I was expecting, and that is, you know, have you picked up any pushback against COFA migrants uh, in areas that have been highly settled? Um, 
migration has 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 been politicized and in in a tremendous degree in the past uh, past ten years and even more so, of course, in just the past few. And I'm just curious, you know, what kind of pushback has have uh, you been able to identify? And and I'll let all three of you tackle that one. I probably get to go first. Um, I I would say that. Um, you know, one one of the one of the things in Guam in particular is that there, there's been a lot of, of um, interest in the in the government to highlight the cost of the migration and to seek federal funds for it. And I know that in meeting with um, you know compact community members there, that one thing they 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 feel is that you know people have a hard time seeing them as a benefit to the society and to the to the economy. And partly, partly just the, the way that people focus on them, uh, and and there are there are concerns in Guam, particularly where uh, a prior prior governor was actually sort of uh, commuting sentences and trying to arrange for uh, DHS to deport people after they've served served prison time, and so there there is a there are things that have happened in Guam that I think the community you know really does sort of sort of feel. Um, I know that as you go, um, you know, in, into the private sector and meet with, for example, with some employers and representatives from businesses themselves, you know, this, this is a community that's respected and appreciated as being a vibrant part of the, of the, of the workforce of Guam. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of people both working in the government at the university and lots of places throughout Guam. So it's, you know, it, that's probably the place that's had the, the largest percentage impact of migration um, in terms of the underlying population and it's, and people have been there for a long time. So there's a couple, there's a couple of different stories that, that you, you sort of hear and, and understand as you interview people. Uh, Caitlin, I don't know if you have something you'd want to add to that maybe about some of the other locations. Sure. So, um, so in Hawaii, we did hear um, among compact migrant community members um, that they feel that they face particular social tension as perhaps one of the newer um, or more newly arrived immigrant groups. Um, we also heard in the Pacific Northwest that some populations felt um, more welcomed there just because they, they felt um, smaller relative to the total um, immigrant population. So they didn't feel as, as singled out. Um, circling back to, to the one, the question about things that surprised us, um, I was surprised the extent across all areas that we heard um, compact migrant communities discussing um, public charge in particular, um, and just the the pervasive concerns about um, whether an enrollment in any um, social programs or federal benefits that populations are eligible for um, would have an adverse um, effect on on future um, ability to reside in the United States. So that was a concern we heard about pretty pretty widespread. Great, thank you very much, uh, David. I didn't know. Did you want to come in on this or, or? Well, I guess just really briefly. I'm a little off topic again, but I guess um, you know I was last in Northwest Arkansas for the prior report, not for this report. And what I walked away with was the way in which um, there were efforts on both the migrants and the um, the, uh, the the citizenry of Northwest Arkansas to integrate. Uh, and really in many ways to welcome. And I thought it was in some ways really most notable or very notable in the poultry industry itself. Uh, and then reading uh, the most recent reports, uh, you know, the press in Northwest Arkansas with respect to, to COVID and all, I guess it just strikes me that the um, that COVID may be a, a, a little bit tearing at the bonds between the, the employers and the employees in that setting. And you know, concerned that that may not be unique to compact migrants, but it is something that is uh, that you know, reading the press is uh, is a, is, a, is an important issue, a live issue. Great, thank you very much. Um, I, just just a couple of uh, quick questions. One one is um, uh, is the report uh, available in languages other than English? No. <laughs> Okay. Uh, we, we did we did have a little bit of a discussion of, of, about this question and 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 noted that there were you know six, six relevant languages for the co-nations um and so we haven't we haven't done that but 
if somebody you know wishes to like take we have a highlights page which is sort of three paragraphs and and if, if somebody wanted to to try to you know do a translation of that and 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 push it out to people we would certainly what you know wel welcome your your efforts to do that because i think i think there is a a challenge to to share and communicate this issue, this information but uh but our work right now is only in english i would just say we would have, we would have loved to do that um i've translated um, reports into Spanish before. And at, at the end of the day, we are a government agency. And the coals we walk over to get those three paragraphs translated into Spanish, I guess, Emil, you and I did uh, Chinese once, right? Um, uh, but the uh, the efforts to get those things translated into a language like Spanish and, and, and Chinese were surprising. Um, and so much as we'd love to do it, I think we ran up against the relative um, obscurity of the language as compared to the, the, the Chinese and the Spanish. Great, thank you. Um, my colleague, Greg Brown, who also teaches at the Center for Australian, New Zealand and Pacific Studies, uh, Greg asked the question about remittances. And I'd be curious, um, Emil, I know that you and I have talked a little bit about the challenge of, of trying to account for remittances, but uh, did you gather any data about remittance levels or uh, the changes in remittances? Uh, we did not uh, co collect any data on remittances for this report, and uh, we we did, you know, sort of uh, discuss with community members sort of their pra their practices, if you will. Um, and so we 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 did learn a little bit about people's participation in supporting um, household events and 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 other uh, important things in their families. Uh, you know, from the mainland, but, but, and, all, and also sometimes, you know, using funds to bring other relatives to the US. Uh, so that was one thing we heard, but in terms of actual, you know, technical data on it, no, we did not collect it. There's been a few household surveys that have been done. Um, Mike Levin, and Fran Hiesel have, have, have done some surveys along those lines. And I think in the national income accounts um, for the three FAS, there's sort of a, uh, a computation of remittance information, but we didn't, we didn't collect it. It was a good question though. Great, thanks very much. Um, a couple of questions about, um, I suppose the pattern of migration from the fast states to the United States. You know, it's, it's one of the interesting things when people begin to think about or talk about migration from fast states to the United States. If you don't know anything about it, someone says, well, there, there are Marshallese who have migrated to Arkansas. And it always causes a bit of sort of Hawaii. And, and so really, I want to just go to the question of, of what are the push, well, what are the pull factors in migration to, um, uh, to the United States and, and its territories? And so what are the, and why do they settle where they settle? I mean, why do migrants go to Arkansas? So I, I would actually say there's, I think there's a, quite a few people on this call that, that know the answer to this much better than I, but I'll, I'll just say a little, a little uh, observational statement from what I think we've seen across these reports and through these interviews. Um, a, lo a lot of people, if you, if you ask them why, they, why they've migrated, will talk about employment opportunities, education opportunities, and following, following family. And so one, one thing I think looking at the distribution of people around the, the, the continental US particularly is in, anywhere that had an educational exchange reaching all the way back into the trust territory time, um, th there's going to be a, a FAS community there. And so there's a lot, a lot of communities in a lot of locations uh, FAS people, you know, are active participants and, and serve in the military. So around some of the places where there's military bases, uh, there's also FAS communities have been established. Uh, in the case of Arkansas, there was a, uh, an important early migrant, I guess. Um, and there was also sort of the, co the uh, it coincided with a great economic opportunity. And the poultry plants were very eager to find um, uh, legal workers for their plants. And so under the Compact Free Association, that was a, a, a natural pairing. And so a lot of, a lot of people did, in fact, uh, move to Arkansas. And from that region now, the, uh, people have sort of 
populated a lot of area, a lot of the nearby states. There's uh, communities that are that are related, um, family members and such. So, and I don't think we have a way maybe to to engage our audience so much, but um, I know there's there's people here who have been part of this migration and really know a lot about it. Um, I think Guam and Hawaii were proximity. You know, this was these these were early first steps and. Uh, the, the data I showed on, on Guam population shows a lot of stability in sort of the aggregate numbers. There are still new arrivals coming in from uh, Micronesia, particularly from Chuuk, maybe from Yap. Uh, and so there, it seems like there is some uh, movement maybe from Guam onto the U.S. And so I know as, as you talk to people, you'll find people that have, you know, they spent a little while in Hawaii and then they moved to the U.S. And so they're there is kind of a movement, I think, to the continental U.S. Great, thank you very much. Um, I'm, you know, you, you can't help but notice, of course, that this report uh, was requested by uh, by this by members of the Senate, and uh, we are certainly in the process of uh, new negotiations or beginning new negotiations uh, with COFA uh, countries. So, can you talk a little bit about how this report fits into? Uh, discussions uh, and new negotiations uh, with compact states. I'll, I'll refer that to David. Well, uh, you know, I, th I think I'd start by saying a report that we issued now, what, a year and a half ago, Emil, on, uh, the, uh, on the economic assistance under the compact uh, is the, perhaps the more direct line between the work that we've done and the current uh, dis discussions where we've um, examined the, uh, the, ex the, the, uh, the extent to which the uh, uh, national accounts of the, of the freely associated states uh, are supported by U.S. government uh, uh, compact grants as well as federal programs. Um, and we speak to uh, you know, a range of issues related to the U.S. federal, federal programs and eligibility, uh, amongst other things. You know, this I think is, um, uh, you know, in some ways more uh, because this is not a provision that expires. Uh, I think it's more context, um, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I, I have no clue as to the extent to which this would come up in bilateral negotiations. Uh, you know, Amo, I think Amo or Caitlin mentioned some of the um, the challenges associated with real ID and the I-94s and the like, and some of that may be issues that are hopefully ironed out. Um, and I think just the being aware of the demographics in the United States is helpful to all parties. Thanks very much. Um, Alan Stamen, um, who I think uh, you all know, uh, Alan has asked the, <laughs> Alan has asked the question, uh, about, uh, and he recognizes that this is really outside of the scope of your, your initial report, your, your, your report that you're talking about today. But could you comment on the, uh, the, how uh, migration has impacted economic development in the FAS states? Uh, for example, has it resulted in gains and losses in skilled workers or an increase in income through remitt remittances? Uh, perhaps, um, uh, uh, Emil, uh, David, Caitlin, you, you might tackle that. I thought that was a question for Al. No, Al Alan's the originator of that question, of course. So um, no, that, that's a really good question. And I think that, um, you know, going all the way back to, to literally the Solomon Report discussion about the future economy of Micronesia, uh, once you, there was the move to what later became the Freely Associated States, sort of identified that the, um, you know, that there's likely to be uh, challenges in economic development and likely to be a need for migration provision, uh, even, even said it might need to be subsidized. Um, and so I think the, the, the relationship between migration and development was sort of established even back in this report to President Kennedy. And I think looking at the, you know, if you look at the, some of the hearing record from the 1980s, there's also some acknowledgement of this. Um, sort of how this would work with respect to increased education levels. I know the question about sort of brain drain is one that's been sort of often, um, you know, raised. 
I don't, I don't know that there's been a, a, a full empirical study of that. Uh, but I think it's, it's obviously one that's an important consideration for this, for, for this migration, right? Because it is unique and it involves, you know, so many different people. So uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think the question about increase in income through remittances, the, the re remittance data, for example, that the IMF has been reporting in its uh, bilateral consultations is, is not particularly uh, great high levels of remittances as compared to some of the other countries uh, in the Pacific or particularly the Central American countries. So um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that's really the way this uh, process has worked at this point. Great, thank you. Um, an, another question, um, and and the the the, the Gabriel uh, acknowledges that this might be beyond GAO scope, but uh, at the same time, the region has seen a diaspora. Uh, at least some jurisdictions, notably Palau, have also created national economies with a mostly foreign-born workforce. Uh, is there a mismatch between the policy objectives and the resulting reality? And and that's for for any of the three panelists. So go, go for it, Emil. No, I was going to turn it to David. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually need to ask a little bit more of a for clarification on the, on the, uh, I mean, one thing I was going to say and fact check me, Emil or others, is that we have it, remittances has come up a couple of times in this conversation, including it embedded in the last question. In my understanding, if, if you're talking about, uh, you know, differences there, that Palau is actually a net negative remittance. Um, that there, there is there is more flow from the uh, workers in the tourist industry back to their home co countries, Philippines by and large, than there is remittances to Palau. Obviously, the, the you know it's 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 quite the inverse in the other two uh, FAS states, FAS countries. But I, but uh, if there's more clarity on, Amy, you look like you're going to answer it. I, I I was going to say on the you know the, the case the case of Palau is is an is an interesting economic structure because the citizens of Palau have migration rights to a, to a location that has higher wages and higher levels of income and different standard of living. A lot of, a lot of Palauans have left. And so, and a lot of them left a long time, you know, you can find Palauans in, in Guam, for example, have been there for 40 years. Um, and so there's been a real outflow of people from Palau the development that's taken place in particularly the tourism sector has been through backfilling with uh, foreign workers. Um, and so it's, it's kind of a unique economy. Um, there's some similarities to it with American Samoa and the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands, uh, which also have, you know, those two U.S. territories have a lot of their citizens living in, you know, outside of the territory in the United States, where people can obviously move freely. And then the economies have relied on, on foreign workers to backfill and to uh, you know, be a fundamental part of the economic development. Just, just if I could jump in on, on your observation about uh, foreign workers in, um, in Palau. <clears throat> I was just was reading in the paper that, uh, last night that of course, Palau hasn't seen um, uh, an international tourist for three months. And uh, they now have displaced international workers, these, these uh, migrant workers who are in Palau to service the tourist industry, and they're stuck. And uh, so Palau is also grappling with this challenge of, of what to do with these, these workers who have come into Palau to service the tourist industry and are effectively unemployed and can't go home. And uh, it's really a very, very uh, uh, challenging situation to be in. Um, Caitlin, I wondered if you, uh, did you want to come in on this at all or? I think my colleagues are better informed on, on this topic. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Um, there, there is, uh, 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 Brittany Wheeler has asked about, uh, um, if you could say more about stakeholder states, jurisdictions that mention nuclear testing uh, and any sort of uh, moral or ethical imperative that seems to be tied to the idea of provisions uh, or of uh, resources in COFA to, to uh, COFA citizens in the states. Uh, I think you can see the question, and I, I'm not I'm not entirely sure. I kind of get the thrust of it, but um, 
Uh, uh, Kate, Caitlin, would you like to take that? Sure, yeah, as you noted, um, we heard from both Washington and Oregon um, state governments in their comment letters on our report about, about this nuclear issue and whether um, there's some sort of further um, economic, either domestic in the United States or in the FAS um, action that should be taken. Um, we also know, I believe in the background of our report, um, the State Department takes a stance on this. Um, and AMO, I'm, I'm, for, I'm blanking on the name of the, uh, <laughs> the provision, but um, that, that's sort of the extent to which we heard about it. I would, I would point you to both the Oregon and Washington comment letters that appear in our appendices. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Jim Berg um, has a question. Uh, when we initially negotiated the compact in the 1980s, the immigration provisions were very important uh, to the, uh, the three country representatives, holding it up as a key element in the economic assistance provisions. Would you say that these provisions have retained their comparative importance to the FAS? I think that's a really, a, a really good question. And I, I know sort of looking at the you know, some of the uh, hearing record from the 80s that one, one of the things really highlighted in this provision was that it, it would give people from the FAS access to US education system and the, uh, the right for employment would allow people to supplement any scholarships they had uh, while, they, while they were seeking an education. So I, it did seem to me that one of the sort of uh, organizational principles of this might've been sort of this is to, for people to get education, get skills and return to the freely associated states. And so it'd be uh, sort of a, a not a, br a brain drain, but really a gaining, gaining skilled workers and, and educated workers. I don't think looking at the uh, demographic information from the three freely associated states that this would be true. I mean, the populations have been relatively stagnant. And so the the birth rate's been made up basic, whatever the birth rate is, has been made up with outward, outward migration. And so I, I don't know that it's really been a source of gains. However, if you go in the freely, freely associated states and, and the, the people leading organizations, be they business or outside of business or, or government rather, um, you know, many, many have been educated in the U.S. And so there's clearly been a, a benefit from being able to you know, to move to the U.S., gain education, gain experience, and then some people then, you know, return home and are leading their, their governments. So I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's, um, you know, the, sort of the economic assistance provision of, of the immigration, sort of if it's played the role people expected. But I know there are some people in our, in our call today that maybe could uh, provide some further insights to that. I would just I would just add quickly that the to the extent that uh, certainly in Congress, but I think while the while the the ball is in the executive branch court, while there's you know discussions around continued economic assistance, the because the migration provision is exists in, in perpetuity essentially, that the the uh, the thing that comes up right away it's a little bit of a apples and oranges, but is eligibility for for Medicaid, and so if you're talking about migration, it is a given. Um, but then when you're talking about uh, the perspective of Guam and Hawaii, certainly, um, as well as, the, as well as the compact migrants, it's about what happened in the late 90s with with me Medicaid eligibility and can that be restored? Great, thank you. Um, there is a question um, uh, about uh, COFA uh, migrants returning to uh, to their island homes. Um, U.S. policymakers in the early days assumed that compact immigrants would not permanently reside in the U.S. And the, the, the assertion is that they didn't need then a path to citizenship. Is there any concern expressed uh, by COFA migrants about their inability to get U.S. citizenship? Did you pick that up at all? Any concerns? I'll let Caitlin uh, also answer this, but I, I would, I would uh, say that from the community meetings that uh, gaining citizenship was not sort of a primary thing people raised or expected. I, mean, I think they sort of understood their, their status as, as not being eligible for, to seek that. Um, I think one of the, you know, one of the, you know, questions about sort of whether people 
um, you know, are, are temporary residents in the U.S. There is there is a lot of of uh, 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 almost conf conflict for people in that a lot of people would would like to, in some sense, return home. Uh, and then two things stop them. One is access to medical care. And then secondly, their children are living in Guam, Hawaii, Arkansas, wherever. And so I think at the end of the day, there's, there's sort of a, often a stated desire to, 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 to return to, to their home country. Um, but then there's really strong things that, are help, that help keep people um, you know, in their retirement and such. And, you know, people talked about, I have grandchildren. And so uh, there were some really clear things that came up. Uh, Caitlin, you, you had more meetings than I did in the Northwest. So did you hear anything different? No, we, we heard relatively similar things there. Um, some people expressed concerns about um, wanting to stay in retirement for access to health care or um, more preferential housing options. Um, in the Pacific Northwest and, and also being tethered to multi-generational families that they started here. Um, I remember one person talking about, uh, well, I was gonna wait till my children went to college and now I'm waiting till my grandchildren go to college and I think I'm gonna stay. Um, one other thing that uh, doesn't, doesn't necessarily speak to um, retirement in particular, um, our report also did a study of net migration um, using some Department of Transportation data that appears in Appendix 3 um, just looking at whether net migration on the whole has has changed over time. Um, so for the gentleman who is interested in the disaggregated data, um, that's another source where we've disaggregated Mar uh, Marshall Islands from Micronesia for Palau in terms of net migration over time, whether people are, are coming or staying. So that was all. Great, thank you very much. Um, my friend Ken Chern um, has asked a question about uh, uh, the role of religious groups um, and has there been any support from religious groups for the migrants in the various states? Uh, Caitlin, would you like to take that? Sure. Yep. Um, in the section of our report where we talk about the, um, the nonprofit and private sector efforts, um, which is not an exhaustive list, we do talk about several religious organizations that have um, assisted compact migrants with transitions or other issues. Um, in particular, in Hawaii, um, the Salvation Army of the Pacific um, has some particular housing and job programs. Um, in Saipan and the Commonwealth of Northern Mariana Islands, um, CARIDOT, um, a Catholic organization, also assists with um, clothing, housing, and, and some food assistance as well. Um, so we, we did hear about it in various locations. And again, what's in our report is not a fully exhaustive list. I, I would also just, just point out, I mean, a number of our community meetings took place uh, under, the, I'd just call it the auspices of, um, of churches. And so they were uh, just thinking about the, the FAS communities, um, you know, in these U.S. areas, a lot of them are, are really organized in, in very tight churches, well organized, and and they represent sort of the, the structure for community engagement. And so that's that's sort of along the lines of of uh, of, of self help, I guess, for a community to look after itself and to and support other members. Great, thank you very much. Um, there is a question that's been put forward about FAS citizens serving in the U.S. military. Um, and uh, one of our, our uh, audience members uh, says that this is an important statistic to have, um, but he wonders whether or not uh, there has been any attempt to, to get those, that kind of data. Does the report mention at all military service? And um, uh, where might you suggest, if you don't have it, where might you suggest this audience member uh, find uh, that kind of data, if it exists? So. So, so that's a that's a really good question, and the, and for this for this report, the only uh, sort of data point that we have on military service is actually from the uh, the American Community Survey, which sort of gives you this range estimate, and it's probably much smaller than people would have expected. So I'll just say that. So this this appears in I don't know what table this is, but a table thirteen in one of our appendices. And so this is from the American Community Survey, and it's 245 people uh, were, have been on act, were, were currently on active duty or had been in the past. 
And so in Hawaii. that's in uh, to amplify that one's in in Hawaii. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong page. My apologies. Thank you, Caitlin, for helping me there. Um, I was going to say that's a really low number. I'm surprised. Um, and so, for for the case of the 50 states, Puerto Rico and, and DC, the number is 1,660. Um, in prior GAO reporting, we did spend some effort trying to get some of this data from the Department of Defense. And I think at the end of the day, we were having a hard time getting uh, comprehensive data. Uh, partly this is due to the fact that they can give you data on the zip code of where people signed up. But for example, if you were a, a, a migrant who had already moved to Hawaii and you enlisted there, you would not be captured like if a, as, a, as being sourced from the FAS. And so some of the some of the data sets are are quite challenging to track people, and we didn't we didn't seek additional data for this job, but uh, somebody could probably seek it from the Department of Defense. Great, thank you for that. So um, I, I just uh, we we seem to be coming to to the end of the questions, I think. So. Um, uh, what I might do is to see if there are uh, any last last questions floating around out there. Uh, is there anything that you were expecting as a question that you haven't heard? I think I think the only I mean we do have this sort of lingering thing from our 2011 work, which was the. Uh, where we particularly commented on the, the adequacy of the cost estimation being done by Hawaii, Guam, CNMI. And we recommended to Interior to, uh, to, do, to put out guidelines. Um, and so that, that's been sort of a concern which people had, had sort of traditionally raised, which is, you know, why can't we have better data? And I, I would still sort of, you know, point to that somewhat as one of the ways to get more consistent reporting uh, you know about sort of these fiscal effects and recognizing that some of this you know states we were meeting with have sort of noted that you know they're not part of the affected jurisdictions today but you know looking ahead maybe they they want to be uh included in this sort of calculation that's that's an area which i i was expecting someone maybe to raise this cost accounting so just find we, 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 we do have one, one last question. So um, uh, we'll take this. And it is simply uh, from Jackie uh, Hazen, uh, community meetings in your report, did, you, uh, did a difference between visitors and migrants arise? People entering Guam, for example, for a week's conference would be counted as, at the border as non-immigrants, as would anyone arriving on an educational or long-term employment. I'm wondering if the census and, or other enumerators of your office accounts for the uh, terms of impact, though, uh, though she realizes that it might be hard to quantify. So, so that I, I think that's a really good question, and my 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 understanding of the of census calculations when they're doing their community survey or they're doing their household surveys is they are looking for people who who who've been present for a while. Mm. So they they have some thresholds for residency, if you will. Uh, Caitlin noted that 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 we do have an appendix where we, we tried something different in this report that we had not previously done, which is we, we did get um, entry and exit information by passport from uh, uh, Customs and Border Protection in the Department of Homeland Security. And, and, and our, our numbers there would net these things out. So if you came in one week, we would count you as an entry, but then we would count you as, a, as an exit as well the next week. And so, uh, that is a really good question as people look at the flows of people as to whether, you know, particularly vis visitors or temporary arrivals are being uh, sort of sorted out, if you will. And so uh, we presented that information in an appendix, and it's really our first time to try to, to test the ability of, of ourselves or other researchers to use that data source. Great. Thank you. Um, there's this the one final question, and it really is about the uh, the, the, the future um, impact of this report. Um, Ingrid is wondering, uh, what are the next steps in this reporting? Are there recommendations typically taken up or implemented? Is there any history to last uh, reports for having uh, made a practical or visible change? Uh, Dave, David, would you like to pick some of this up? 
no, no, I'd like you to take it. But, uh, <laughs> um, uh, well, you know, I'm, I'm going back to the, this report did not contain recommendations. The prior report uh, contained, Emil, help me out here, four recommendations, I do believe. It, the, the first was on um, uh, asking Interior, recommending that Interior um, develop uh, guidelines for the affected jurisdictions on how to sort of standardize and per perhaps uh, up the accuracy of the um, cost enumerations. We also at that time had concerns about the different types of enumerations that were in play. Um, it's become it's become moot a little bit because the 2018 enumeration, well, it could come back into play, but depending on the future, but right now 2018 is the last enumeration. But the time we did that work, there was some may recall the snowball technique and a block census by by and uh, a census in the Mariana Islands, as well as then the use of the American Community Survey. And so, um, to the extent that there is uh, that uh, whatever comes of the the uh, consultations that are taking place now leads to uh, uh, future compact impact f funding. I think how these are enumerated is important. It sort of a little bit comes back to what we've we touched on with respect to the, the extent to which the the American Community Survey is a undercount, and um, you know we we stand by it strongly as a trend, but I'm not sure that we you know can speak to the extent to which others have identified higher numbers of migrants. Um, it is it is what the U.S. government can produce at this point, and I think that's important to, you know, to stipulate. Yeah, I'll add one one comment to to the to the general question, which is actually reflecting back to the 2001 GAO study, uh, which which came at the end of the first assistance period of the FSM RMI compacts, and in that report we um, we we discussed the migration trends, but population numbers. We discussed some of the, the reported impacts that were experienced, particularly in that time by Hawaii, CNMI, and Guam. And in 2003, Congress did uh, create the, uh, the structure for there to be an appropriated and authorized $30 million a year compact in, impact grant. So that was one way that, that this, uh, this kind of GAO reporting was previously used by the Congress. And so, you know, it, it predated the, 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 the end of funding by a couple of years. And uh, this one's in roughly the same time frame for congressional consideration of what the experience has been in the, in the U.S. areas. Um, and, you know, it, it is, you know, very much up to the Congress as to how it wishes to, uh, to respond to that. Thank you very much. Um, well, Caitlin, Emil, David, thank you very much for a, a fascinating uh, discussion of the uh, diaspora uh, from fast states in the United States. It's, it's really uh, quite compelling. I was just reflecting on the nature of this conversation. One of the things that happens in my job is I hear from Australians and New Zealanders and they say how thrilled they are. To, to hear in Washington, D.C. discussions of the Pacific Islands, because I think they've decided that uh, in Washington, we never talk about the Pacific Islands. So they're thrilled that it happens. But one of the things that really I find so encouraging about this discussion we've just had is that it's very um, granular. It is uh, open. It is accessible to the public. And I point out to my Australian and New Zealand friends that we in the United States have really very transparent discussions uh, over uh, the Pacific Island relationships. And, and then I take my bat and my ball and I go home. So I feel very good about that. that that's, that's great. So I wanna thank you all very much for your time and for joining us in this Pacific Island Roundtable on uh, the compact states and the diaspora here in the United States. Look forward to our next presentation, which should come sometime in August. The uh, topic is yet to be determined. So uh, until then, have a wonderful 4th of July. Uh, stay safe and we'll catch you later. Thanks, bye-bye. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. No worries. Thank you.